Give my 
And the children may come forward. Good morning. Oh, golly. Do you guys just get up? <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Hi, Maddox. How are you? Good. I'm glad to hear that. All right. So let's see. I'm not used to props, so I need a I need prompter here. <coughs> so what did we talk about Friday night, Ryland? What was the word we talked about? Lent. Um, and re. <laughs> we talked about a lot of things. Yes. Yes, and we we had Grandpa to make fun of, and we we were very busy. So I'm not surprised you can't remember. Repent. Repent. And I said, what fun things can we do for repent? <laughs> so I found something. So I found something. Um, so repent is a word that we use often in Christianity because it's very vital to our Christianity and believing in God. Repent is when we um, turn away from our sin. We turn away from something that we shouldn't be doing, like talking about our friends. That's, these are things that we talked about. Talking about our friends behind their back and being mean to someone and not sticking up for someone and, and lying and cheating and um, all those things that um, we should not be doing. It Repenting is when we turn away from that and, and do everything in our power and the, with the power of Jesus in us to not do that anymore. Okay, that's what repentance mean. Um, and so it means turning away from what you know to be wrong and turning to God. So I'm going to show you this little object lesson. So let's pretend this is our lives. This is our lives, see through. You can, you know, that's, that's your life right there. And these are M&Ms. These are all the good things that God has to give us. Now, granted, don't tell my dad I'm doing this. Um, these, these are all God's good gifts. Oh, oh. Five second rule. Where'd it go? It's over here. Oh, just one. I thought I dropped two. Oh my goodness! Oh, there goes another. <laughs> it was like Lucy at the chocolate factory. All right, let's keep eating them. <laughs> no one sees them. All right, so this is your life, and this is all the good things God has to give you. Uh oh. Did that work very good? No. 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 So, what do I need to do? Push a couple of I need to turn my life in a different direction so that I can receive all that God has to give me. Okay. If we want to be filled with the good things of God, we need to be turned towards God. We need to be aware of him and, and trying to live for him in order to get everything that he has to offer us. So when it was turned upside down, when, it was, we, when our life was doing not godly things, we weren't receiving what God had to give us. But when we repent, when we turn our life around, then we are ready and able to receive all the goodness of God. Does that make sense? Yeah? I should have brought enough M&Ms for, I mean, I have enough for everybody, but not very many. So I don't know what to do with these. Do you think you should take them downstairs in your hand? No, they would melt. They would melt. They don't melt in your hand. They melt in your? That's right. Here, I'll do this and you can share. I'll pour them back in here. 
Good thing I ate a couple. There wouldn't have been room. Okay. So we don't want to be upside down. We don't want to be not in, able to receive what God has to offer us. So we repent. We turn from our ways, and we receive all the goodness of God. Would Harper have thought that was fun? Pray not, huh? No. No. Well, did you get the word? Did you get repent? Repentance? Do you think you'll remember that now? It means turning, turning from your, the way you shouldn't be to accept all that God has to offer. What good things does God have to offer us? Eternal life, food, everything, love, peace, donuts. Anything else good? From God, talents. our pa- talents, mm-hmm. our parents, water. Amen. We need water to live, don't we? Yep. The air we breathe. Amen. He gives us everything we need. All right. Let's pray. Dear God, Dear when we are turned away from you, when we are turned away from you, help us to repent. Help us to repent and turn towards you. And turn towards you. So we will welcome you in our lives. So we will welcome you in our lives. And be open for receiving. And be open for receiving. All that you have for us. All that you have for us. In Jesus' name. In Jesus name. Amen. we share our joys and concerns with one another and the prayers that we have gotten in Uh, Linda McMurray has asked for prayer for Tammy a mother of a friend of Zach's whose organs are failing also for Coral's father um, who is in stage four leukemia please keep them in your prayers for healing Um, Sharon, her friend Barb, is off the ventilator. That is good news. She's still weak, but she is going home. Wynette has a couple of praises, the women's Bible study, learning so much there, and a great time of fellowship and learning. Um, Yeah, learning has been really good there. Um, And praise that they're back from Georgia safely and that Nanette is with her for a while. And it's so good to see both of you here with us. Yeah. Becky B. asked for continued prayers for Jeff after a recent surgery, her son-in-law. Prayers for Jenny um, as she needs strength to be a caregiver, as we all do. Um, and safe travels for Becky. She didn't ask for that, but I did. Prayers for safe travels. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Oh God, help us as adults to be open to all you have to give us. And it's not so much the things you have to give us, it is giving us you, giving us you in the form of Jesus Christ who went to the cross for us to save us from our sins, that sacrifice, that perfect sacrifice for each one of us. We want to be open to receiving that and to understand what that means to our lives and how we live our lives because of that. When we grasp that reality of Jesus Christ and his love for us and your love for us, Father, we, um, our lives can't possibly be the same. When that knowledge in our head goes to our heart, we can't help but be different. 
never have we experienced in our human lives the love that we get from you, the peace we get from you, the comfort. You provide for all of our needs. We love you because you promised to never leave us nor forsake us. You are a good God, full of mercy and grace. And we thank you that you call us your children. We pray for Tammy and, or for, yeah, Tammy. And we pray for Coral's father. We pray for Jeff. We ask that your healing touch be upon them, that your hand is placed on them, and Father, they are healed. And sometimes, Lord, we know that that doesn't mean in this world. It means in your perfect world. Father, may your good and perfect will be done in their lives as you heal their bodies. And Father, we ask for strength for the caregivers because no one goes through their journey alone. There is somebody walking alongside them other, as well as you. But there is somebody who is there to pick up the load. And so we ask for strength for them, for Jenny and all of those who are in the caregiver position. We praise you that Barb is off the ventilator. We pray that she gets stronger every day. We praise you for the women's Bible study and the eager, the eagerness to learn your word that, that um, we are feeding off of each other. We are, we are grasping that desire to learn when we are with others. We thank you that Nanette and Wynette are here with us and their travels were safe and, and that they get to spend time together here in Ohio. And Lord, they bless us when they are here. And we ask you to bless them. We ask for safe travels for Becky there while she's there on her way back. We need her back here with us one day after her travels. Keep her safe. And keep her blessed. Father, we thank you for those in this church who um, do so much to keep it going. Those unspoken heroes that um, just keep doing what needs to be done. Andrew and Emily and Scott and Wayne and, oh gosh, I should name names because I'm going to forget somebody, but Lord, when I look out into this congregation, I see a whole group of people doing your work. They defy the 20%, do 80% of the work. They are all in, and they are eager to do what you've called them to do. May we never lose that excitement May we never lose that, um, that interest, that, just that purpose. May we never lose our purpose. We thank you for our Sunday school teachers, the ones who are up here and the ones who are with the kids now. We thank you for our beautiful decorations on the altar. Someone using the gift that you have given them to make a, a beautiful we thank you for those who start Bible studies. We thank you for those who start um, the men's woodworking group and the secret sisters and all of those ministries that we have going on here for a rep to agape so that we know what's going on. On and on, so many people involved in doing your work, the ladies who do the supper week after week. and those who deliver. Thank you for a church who is eager to do your work. Keep us there, God. Keep us there. Keep us even more excited. May every time that we hear of a need, may we just get excited about fulfilling that need. Every time there is something in the community that needs a group of people, may we just raise our hand and say, pick us. 
Here we are, Lord, send us. May we not let what's going on in the Methodist Church uh, stop any of our ministry, but may we just forge full force ahead and do your work. Here we are, Lord. We give ourselves to you so you can use us. And we couldn't do it without you. We can't do any of what we do without you, without those gifts and talents and that energy and that support and that nudging and making us aware of what our purpose is. So everything we do, we do in honor of you and for your glory. May we never stop. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And before Bev sets down, I want her to come forward. Mm. I want you to outstretch your reach out in an outstretched arm to your pastor. Father God, I just pray for Bev this morning. I ask your Holy Spirit fall upon her, that you fill her with your spirit, that you give her wisdom and you give her the words to speak this morning. Father, I ask that you, again, anoint your sister, our sister, your daughter, our pastor, as she brings forth your message this morning. May the anointing of her lips fall upon anointed ears and anointed hearts in this congregation this morning. Father, move her out of the way so that you can receive the glory and the honor and the praise that is rightly due unto you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning comes out of the book of Luke, chapter 13, verses 1 through 9. If you have your Bibles or your uh, devices, Never thought in a million years I would ever say that. <laughs> Your devices. And uh, follow along with me, if you will. Now there were some present at the time who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. And Jesus answered, do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? I say, I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. Or those 18 who died when the Tower of Siloam fell on them, do you think they were more guilty than all the others living in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. Then he told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he went to look for fruit on it, but did not find any. So he said to the man who took care of the vineyard, For three years now I've been coming to look for fruit on this fig tree and haven't found any. Cut it down. Why should it use up the soil? Sir, the man replied, Leave it alone for one more year, and I'll dig around it and fertilize it. If it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, then I will cut it down. In this lesson, Jesus mentioned two disasters of his day. One was an evil committed by the hand of man. And the other was an accident, accidental disaster when the um, Tower of Siloam fell on the 18 and killed them. Now, it is common for humans, for us, to um, think of certain people as good and certain people as bad. In our categorizing of people, it's easy for us to fall into the thought pattern that God should allow good things to happen to good people and bad things to happen to bad people. In our world, that makes sense. And of course, we will be the judge of who is good and who is bad. We will compare them to ourselves. We will compare them to people like us, to our families. 
as we determine who is good and who is bad, we can then define the fate they should encounter. Jesus corrected this thinking. <laughs> Jesus pointed out that not, the, not that the Galileans in question were innocent. He wasn't saying they hadn't done anything wrong. Actually, there was not a lot of discussion about what took place. And, and even there is no other record of this happening other than this passage right here. There's no historical account of that happening. However, Pilate did actually kill Galileans in other circumstances, and so it's quite possible that that did happen. Well, it is possible because it's God's word, and God's word is true. So it did happen, but um, there, it's not historically written down. But Jesus' point was not that these Galileans were innocent, his point was that they were simply not more guilty than the others. All people were guilty. All people are guilty. <laughs> we are guilty. We're sinners. I thought this was an interesting quote by Charles Spurgeon. He wrote, it is true, the wicked man sometimes falls dead in the street. But has not the minister fallen dead in the pulpit? It is true that a pleasure boat in which men were seeking their own pleasure on a Sunday has suddenly gone down. But it is, not, is it not equally true that a ship which contained none but godly men who were bound upon an excursion to preach the gospel has gone down too? Jesus tells them that they are trying to discern from an external perspective how close a person is to God. In their faulty thought process, if people are suffering, they are obviously, um, they have angered God. If people are suffering, they've angered God. They have done something wrong, they have sinned bigger than anyone else because they are suffering. If they're happy and healthy, then obviously God is happy with them. And if that were the case, then the book of Job would be a farce and would be a lie. And by that same standard of faulty thinking, Jesus would be called a sinner because didn't he suffer? So Jesus answered them, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. In analyzing the issue, Jesus turned his focus from the question, why did this happen, to what does this mean to me? Lord, what do you want me to learn from this? The lesson Jesus is teaching is that each one of us could die at any given moment. It's true. Any moment, one of you, gone. In the realm of that true possibility, repentance must be a top priority. Repentance must be a top priority. The Galileans offering their sacrifices to God in the temple did not ex expect to die doing so. The 18 killed when the tower at Siloam fell on them did not expect to die that day. The Columbine students getting ready for school that tragic day thought it would be just another day in class. And the workers in the World Trade Center were probably thinking about what they were going to be doing after work that day, that fateful day we call 9-11. None of these individuals thought they would die soon, but they did. The vast majority of them were probably not ready to die. Lord, what do you want us to learn from this? And Jesus' answer is, repent. Tragedies happen. Sometimes those tragedies are the beginning of people nudged towards, towards God. I would say that's what happened to me when my first husband died. That was my beginning of being nudged towards God. But as the verses suggest, oftentimes tragedy and hardship come so suddenly that they mark the end, which would have been for my husband. It was his last chance. It was the end for him. Praise be to God, he did believe in Jesus Christ. 
Sometimes those tragedies are not the beginning of our opportunities to live our lives for God. They are the end of our chances. The truth is, it may or may not be today, but death and God's judgment are going to happen. We are to be ready through true repentance. And somebody is thinking, oh, good, I've got this one. This one I've got. Every night before I, bed, I, I go to bed, I confess my sins. I don't fall asleep until I confess my sins for that day. And that's awesome. Confession is vital to the soul, and it is good for a rela good relationship with Jesus. Repentance, however, goes further than our prayers of confession. You see, repentance takes action. Repentance involves submission. Repentance means trust. Trusting that your submission to Jesus will change your life. Change the way your mind works. Seeing life and life circumstances in a new way. Repentance is developing a different perspective. Repentance is confessing our sin and trusting in the power of Jesus Christ to not commit that sin again. Repentance is a desire to live in obedience to God. Repentance is signing up for God's upside-down world, where the first will be last and the last shall be first, where we learn to love our enemies, put others before ourselves, give sacrificially, love unconditionally, and serve unselfishly. Because the fact remains that no one escapes judgment day. And those are the things that will be judged by God. Not how many hours we put in at work or how big our bank account is. <laughs> Thank goodness. <laughs> Not about our bank account. The basic question will be, how did you give your time, your talents, and your resources to further the kingdom of God? One, one question on the quiz. <laughs> how did you give your time, your talents, and your resources to further the kingdom of God? Now, this is after you've already made your way into heaven. Okay, there's that judgment where it's you believe in Jesus Christ or you don't. If you believe in Jesus Christ, then you give an account for your life. How did you give? your time, your talents, your resources to further the kingdom of God. As we continue in verses 6 through 9, Jesus illustrates some principles regarding God's judgment in the story of the unfruitful fig tree. That story where the man um, had a tree, a fig tree um, planted, came back three years, he came back every year and there was no fruit there. The third year he said, this is a waste of soil and energy and pull it out, get rid of it, cut it down. <clears throat> and, the, and the vineyard keeper said, oh, give it one more year. Let me water it and let me um, fertilize it and let me take good care of this and give it another year. I honestly can't help but ask the question, what were you doing the first three years? <laughs> After the warning, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Jesus used this parable to illustrate principles of God's judgment. The first point was simple. God looks for fruit. The fruit of our lives shows what kind of person we really are. An apple tree will bring forth apples, not watermelons. I mean, what kind of fruitful tree are you or aren't you? <laughs> If Jesus Christ has truly touched our lives, it will show in the fruit we bear, even if it takes a while for that fruit to come forth. When I think of that, even though it takes time for the fruit to come forth, I think about, you know, some journeys, some, all of our journeys with God are different. I mean, if each one of us told our journey right now, there would be, however many of us are there here, 300 different stories <laughs> and some you know you, you start out and you just start going and doing and it's like <laughs> and it's like um I, I, 
sign up for the Sunday school, I'll do it. Want to have a women's Bible study, I'll do it. We need to take a dinner, I'll do it. (laughs) You're that kind of person. And others want to thoughtfully think about what they're getting themselves into. (laughs) And that's okay too. You know, we read the Bible. We want to make sure we've read it all the way through so we have the knowledge behind us. We want to go forward. Some of us pray for, you know, a good couple years before we move forward. And, and, but that's, those are all good ways of journeying with God. It's, he uses our personality and he uses our, um, the way that we are, our characteristics to pursue, pursue us and move us. So whatever your journey has been, own it own it. For years, I thought, well, I don't have a salvation date. I can't say it was July something. I'm not even sure what year it was because it was such a long, gradual process. I believed in God all my life, but I didn't know him. And so it took me a while to get to know him. It took me a while to get to understand the Trinity. It took me a while. I mean, I evidently was a very slow learner because I think my salvation date is like from 2000 to, I don't know, what year is this? 2022. <laughs> and I hope that I never stop learning. And I hope that, you know, that's how, how you feel too. But anyway, so um, even if that fruit takes a while, God's, God's working in you. If you're opening yourself up, if you have turned your cup upside down and accept all that God has to offer, your fruit will show. It's coming. The bad thing is when you had fruit and then you stop bearing fruit. Mm, 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 mm. I don't think that's a good situation. I'm looking right. I don't see that happening here, but that's not it. Some people do that. They get all excited, and then they go, eh, I didn't really get anything out of it, or, you know, didn't feed me, or whatever the saying is that we Christians sometimes spew out there. Um, So what fruit is God looking for? Well, we'll start with the fruit of the Spirit. We find that in Galatians chapter 5. Love, peace, joy, Patience, kindness, forgiveness, goodness, self-control, faithfulness, faithfulness, faithfulness to God, faithful to each other, faithfully, faithful to carry out your purpose. Do you display love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control? The owner waited three years, and there was no fruit. He wanted to cut it down. The keeper of the vineyard convinced the man to give it a second chance. If it doesn't do well this year, then you can cut it down. Be assured that the day would come. The day of reckoning would come. The man would check on, check on it in the, um, the following year. It was not an empty um, threat or promise or whatever, but... What we need to learn is that God does give second chances. But there comes a time when it's the last chance. So the lesson here is to live for Christ every day. Repent. Be ready. Live like you're going to meet the Father tonight. There's many lists that have been compiled Um, with answers when people are asked, if you had a year to live, you found out you only had a year left to live, what would you, what would you do? How, what would, how, what would you do if you only had one year to live? And I've written down bits and pieces from the different articles I read. Get at least one tattoo. (laughs) (laughs) Work out. I'm thinking, (laughs) well, you know what I'm thinking. Um, Tell my mom I love her every day. Road trip with my dad or my grandpa. Fill out an organ donor card. Erase my internet history. That makes me a little nervous about some people. Pay my debts. 
pare down my material possessions so my kids won't be burdened cleaning up after me. Ask forgiveness of those I've wronged. Forgive those who I believe have wronged me. Make one last contribution to the greater good. I would do activities that require reasonable risk so I could conquer some of my long-held fears. Think about your fears. What are you going to do about it? Nothing? Is that what Judy said? Nothing? <laughs> well, she doesn't have to repent for lying. <laughs> I would thank many people who have taught me along the way. I would visit patients that were approaching the end of their lives and ask them what they have learned in their lifetimes and what they regretted. I would take time to re, uh, try to restore relationships that I've damaged. This is the one I have asterisked. Eat whatever I want to eat. <laughs> Derek would see me every day. <laughs> I would devote my life to uplifting people. There was one particular Christian woman who had written quite a few thoughtful answers, and I want to share those with you as well. Her name is Nadine, and she said, I would write intentional letters. I would make sure I had a stack of letters to be given to each person I love after I passed on, hopefully encouraging them to pursue life and get God, pursue life and God full speed, and to rejoice at my returning to Christ in heaven. I would visit my relatives. Trying at least, trying one last time to share the importance of Christ. I would pray and fast more. This is one of the th those things I already try to do, but I'm a spiritual wimp. Praying is the more tough side of relationship with Christ for me. I would love to devote hours, and I mean carpet burns on the knees hours, to praying fasting and communing with God. The one time, she says, the one time I intentionally fasted and pushed myself past my human desires, it completely changed me. And that was just one time. My real goal in my last year would be to live as passionately as my weak, shy, cowardly human body allows for God's glory. So why wouldn't we be doing that now? <laughs> can I suggest an answer to this question for you an answer for you to for us us together to strive for somebody asked you what you would do if you found out you had only a year to live the best answer would be I would do exactly what I'm doing right now. Passionately, living passionately, as passionately as my weak, shy, cowardly human body would allow for God's glory. Live in such a way that your answer would be, I would be do exactly what I'm doing now. There's no reason we can't be doing that now. Repent, trust in him, and shine the light of Jesus in your life. And I know probably if you found out you had a year to live, there would be several of you who would quit your job. And you're thinking, but I can't quit my job because I need to work. That is true. But you shine the light of Jesus at your work. You live passionately for him at your work. You let God be seen through you in the workplace. Repent. Trust in him and shine the light of Jesus in your life. Wherever you are. Wherever we are. I remember a time when I used to take vacation and it was like, oh good, I can do whatever I want. I'm on vacation. That included many things that... Um, let's just say I repented for at the end of the week. <laughs> <laughs>
I don't know. Once, once God got a hold of me, it doesn't seem so important anymore. I mean, I want every day to be for him. What would you do if you knew you had one year to live? Live each day for God. What would you do if you knew you had 50 years to live? Live each day for God. Let's pray. Oh God, let's help us to not make this a, um, like a New Year's resolution. We will do this. We will do that. that. This time, we mean it. Lord, help us to every day just put you first. You make it very simple to love and to um, offer kindness and goodness and joy to others. We don't have to do anything special. It doesn't have to be um, news breaking. It simply has to be uplifting people and shining the light of Jesus. Help us to do just that. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And on that list that we will not continue to do will be eat anything and everything. <laughs> <laughs> You, you know, I'm often, I'm, this came to my mind as when she talked about repentance. Whatever that sin is that keeps you from drawing closer to God, you want to give to Him. Give it to Him. Don't ask Him to take it. Give it to Him. God's not going to take anything. You have to give that sin to Him. And then if you take it back and continue to do it, you've stolen from the Father. Because he has taken something that you have given him, and if you take it back, you've stolen it right back from him. So make sure when you pray, Lord, take this from me. Or I give this to you, I should say. I give this to you, and I don't want it back. And then you turn never to do it again. Amen? Let's stand. It's your breath in our lungs So we pour out our praise We pour out our praise It's your breath in our lungs So we pour out our praise to you only It's your breath in our lungs So we pour out our praise it's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise to you It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise to As you go, receive this blessing. Thank you.